Welcome to uh, this session um, from the Australia Council of Arts. This is the first sustainability webinar of um, a series of three. My name is Beatrice and I'm a facilitator and a producer, and I'm very excited to be having this conversation today. Um, I am a woman in my 30s and I've got dark hair and a blonde tinge, and today I am wearing a black turtleneck. And today is a conversation about a new story of climate hope and collective action. So in a moment, I will throw to our speakers um, to introduce themselves quickly, but I would first like to acknowledge that I'm standing on the unceded lands of the Ghana people and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I would also like to acknowledge First Nations people, both here in Australia and all around the world who have really been the first resistors to the climate crisis and also um, too often on the front lines. Uh, so we've got a lot to talk about today, but before we get started, I'll start with some quick notes. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the first session of three sustainability webinars hosted by the Australia Council for the Arts. Um, we have Erin, who is Auslan interpreting for us today and these sessions are also going to be recorded and held on the Australia Council website as a permanent resource. And along with that recording, there will be a bunch of tools and guides and resources on how to kind of use this session to be inspired and take action, both within the industry and also more broadly in your communities. Um, and we will also have some time at the end of the session for a Q&A. So if anyone has any questions um, for our wonderful speakers, you can pop that in the chat at the end. Uh, so today we are talking about storytelling. And I think we all now know that we are in a critical decade of action. And it's going to take a massive all hands on deck approach to really turn things around. We know the science is unequivocal and we need to make big changes, um, but we also do know that there's still a window to make those changes. And uh, I think sometimes it's kind of overwhelming or complex or we don't really know where to start. So that's exactly what this webinar series is hoping to provide, is not only practical, accessible solutions and actions that we can all take in our industry and as art makers and practitioners, um, but also more broadly in our communities because we are all in this together and there's a huge challenge ahead of us, um, but fostering a collective approach to these shared challenges, not only in the arts and cultural sector and our role in sharing those stories, um, but also more broadly as a community and a world. Um, so the aim of this webinar series is to really uh, support the sector in that capacity building, to build knowledge, to share actions, um, and also hopefully build some inspiration on how we can all be agents of change. Uh, so there is a lot to dive into and I'm very excited to welcome our four speakers um, this morning. So we're still waiting on Cedric Varco to jump on. Um, but in the meantime, I will uh, jump to... Yeah. Cedric, you're there, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, afternoon, I worked it out. <laughs> sorry, yes. I didn't see you on the screen there. Um, so I'll pass over to Cedric first to quickly introduce yourself um, before we dive into the session. Uh, over to you, Cedric. Deadly. So yeah, my name is Cedric Varko and I'm a Ramanjari Naranga artist and cultural warrior, sharer and, and practicer and keeper. And uh, I live on my ancestral lands in Port Elliot um, next to Victor Arbor. And uh, yeah, um, you know, I've been painting over the years for the last uh, 30 some years. And um, yeah, lately I've been come as a, you know, collected artist, celebrated artist, but also in um, running workshops and cultural tours here on country and, and further afield uh, for the last 17 years uh, since I lived in Port Pirie and then moving back onto country. And uh, and I enjoy it, and I'm passionate about you know connecting people with culture and the country, and caring for country, and caring for our, our sacred sites, and and our very important story dreaming sites that we have throughout our lands and and our waters. 
So yeah, that's what I've been doing. I'm uh, yeah, I've got long hair, big beard, and um, and a big follower. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Cedric. Um, I might jump to Claire now. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Claire O'Rourke. I'm a, a climate advocate and writer and a former journalist. And I currently, my main gig is working as the um, social movements director at the Sunrise Project, which is an organisation that aims to accelerate the transition of our energy system as quickly as possible. And um, I'm a white woman in my mid 40s. I've got a Navy T-shirt on and I'm at home in my home office. I've got red hair and my glasses on. And I am so lucky to be dialing in from Darawal country this afternoon. My, um, I'm right in the middle of the Illawarra Escarpment rainforest. And um, I hope you've all had a chance to do a bit of country connection today because it's a special thing for me to do just as part of my daily practice. Thanks, Claire. I'll hand over to Yale. Well, I'm about 10 minutes further south than Claire. I could probably cooey and she might hear me. Um, I too am on Dural country and, and I was lucky enough to, to walk the beach this morning. And, um, and that's, that's also a practice I like to, to do every day with my, with my young baby and the dog and, um, and connecting with, with nature and with country is, is super important to me as well. So I think, thanks to, Claire for reminding me of that, but that is kind of a, a practice that we can, you know, just engage in straight up. Um, I'm a small lady. I have white skin. I am a Jewish person. Um, and I've got overalls on today, my uniform. And, um, and I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Um, I'm an actor by trade, but in uh, 2019, I turned my hand to positive climate action and I've sort of gone on a weaving path to find my way to found an organisation called High Neighbour um, and very pleased to be part of this really dynamic, beautiful movement and excited about all the good things we can do. Amazing. Thank you, Yale. And Andy. Thank you, B. Hi, uh, I'm Andy Packer. I'm the uh, Artistic Director and CEO of uh, Slingsby, a theatre company based on Ghana Mirna country, Adelaide Plains, which is where I am today. Uh, I'm a 51-year-old man with blonde hair. I've got glasses and I'm wearing uh, a handmade tweed vest. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation. And um, so Slingsby, we're a theatre company and we make theatre for an audience that includes adults and young people aged eight and up. We're very interested in the intergenerational audience. And, um, and we've been making stories and pieces of theatre about hope and wonder and beauty for the last 15 years and touring across South Australia, across the country and to 12 countries around the world. So I'm really happy to be honoured to be part of this group, for this conversation. Amazing. Thank you, Andy. Um, so a lot to dive into and these wonderful four speakers um, are really all kind of harnessing the power and potency of storytelling in different ways throughout their art and their practice and also within their communities. So really excited to hear those stories today. And I'd like to first start um, or jump back to Cedric um, because I think when we think of storytelling as a medium, um, you know, First Nations people were really our first storytellers um, in this country and across the world. And these stories not only help us kind of connect with each other and understand how we are in the world um, and relate to one another, but also to really um, tell the stories of care for country and our, our living systems and our connection to that. So, you know, I think those kind of stories have kind of been overshadowed by this new colonial mindset of growth and capitalism and consumerism. Um, and in this time of crisis, I think we really do have an opportunity to start sharing different stories and recentering that First Nations wisdom and culture and going back to that story of caring for country. So 
I mean, Cedric, your work um, is so central around those messages and not only the story of nature and our connection to that, but also the stories of your family and culture and place. Um, so I'd love to start with you um, sharing some of that. Yeah, it's, um, well, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to come and share with you. You know, it is a pleasure to be here to be able to talk about, you know, the, the importance of story and, and our culture is embedded in that. You know, when I'm, uh, when I was a boy, I was fortunate enough, you know, and I'm uh, early 40. And, uh, you know, I'm probably the last generation to really, you know, be immersed in, in culture. And, uh, you know, growing up where we went to sites and, and we, you know, my, my family were very, um, you know, like activists, they were fighting against, you know, some of the um you know the development that was going on on very important sites like i'm not sure if any of you know but i my island bridge and uh you know and the where that bridge is situated the site that it is built on is actually a very important site for our women but also for for my particular family in general because that was their ancestral lands that you know was was being uh destroyed and, um, you know, so over the years, like as an artist, um, you know, when I first started off painting, it it was sort of, you know, like a little hobby that my family did when I was younger. And, and as I've grown older and had a family, it was something that I wanted to give to my family. And uh, so I would sit and paint and share stories. And and as, as I was doing that, I, I noticed there was a need for, you know, to share our stories because people were visiting the lower river Murray lakes Kurong, around the kangaroo island and 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 also on the um york peninsula but nobody knew our stories nobody knew about our sites and and how important they were so so you know at this time i was living in port perry and living on the ancestral lands of the nukuna people and, um, you know, living away from country where Nukuna is my Naranga um, people's um, neighbours. And, uh, you know, it gave me, a, you know, this idea of, you know, creating artwork that told our stories, you know. And, and uh, as I started to realise and started to, you know, immerse myself into the art, um, I started realizing a lot of people that I was connecting with actually had a connection or or visited at one point or, or holidayed within my ancestral lands, but did not know any stories or did not see any artwork or, or anything that represented our rich culture history in our, on our lands and through our waters. And so as I, uh, you know, started creating, I, I come really passionate about you know, bringing our stories to life. And when I say, yeah, I'm talking about me, my family and my people, you know, and, and uh, you know, making people aware that wherever you tread, you're treading on important um, sites, you know, and we're all interconnected. When we say Naranjiri, you know, and I said, Raman, I'm a Ramanjiri person of the Naranjiri nation. Um, Naranjiri is a nation that, that lands covers the lower river Murray, lakes and Korongs, and, and through the Fluria Peninsula ran to Kangaroo Island and, and Kangaroo Island in general. And, uh, you know, we've got a, a great story creator called Narundri who, who came from up north along the Darling River and came down through into the lands of the Narundri. As he made the river Murray with the help of Pondi the Murray codfish, he, he then entered into the lakes and, and he created all the fish in our waterways from, from the Murray cod fish, Pondy. And then he moved about our land. So, so now where the townships are now within the Flurio, the Lower River Murray and Korong, they are actually Narangiri communities. They were always Narangiri communities before they became Victor Arbor, Port Elliot, um, um, Cape Jervis, Waipinga, um, uh, Gulwa, Murray Bridge, Taylor Ben, Manham, Meningi, um, uh, Kingston, places like that, you know, they were all Narangiri communities before they became 
what are now towns. And in them towns, a very in most towns within our Naranjiri lands have got a particular story to it. Either from Naranjiri, our creator who created them places, um, or from other ancestral beings who, who, who created them places for us. So when we look at like Port Elliot, I live at Port Elliot, it's called Kunjanwald in our language. Kunjanwald refers to the place where he cried a lot. And so Kunjan means like where lots of uh, water flows. Um, so it's where his tears had flown. He made springs. There's only one spring visible today that's been made into a well. And there is no story around the well that represents our creation, but it's got the colonial story in, you know, that's prominent there on that site. Uh, you know, everybody knows Oshu Bay, you know, they either come here for swim and surf and, or, or to visit or all of that. But they don't realize that that's actually where Narundri sat and created and made what is now Oshu Bay. He threw his fishnet into the water and made the rocky island called Pullen Island. And, uh, you know, every time I visit, you know, I was down in Pultang this morning, that's Victor Arbor. Pultang is referenced to the place, to, the, to a bit of the club, uh, our combat club that we use. And, uh, and some of you might be aware of, you know, the recent proposal of development happening at the bluff. Um, well, the bluff is a very significant cultural site for Narangiri, for Ramangiri for my particular family in general, because my particular family came from that area. And uh, they, they seen the first non-Indigenous people come into our waters in that area. And, um, and uh, it's a very important cultural site. It's actually a part of our dreaming story, part of our song line. And it's a part of our spiritual journey too. When we, we pass this world and travel to the next world, the spirit world, that's where we rest before we head off to Kangaroo Island. To, to Carter. And so as I'm painting the stories, like I'm keeping alive, like how, you know, how significance we have to these stories, but also, you know, bringing awareness and education to those who, who, who then um, purchase that artwork to, uh, you know, a, has always had some connection to our lands or to our waters, to some part of it in general. And when they take it home, they appreciate the stories that come with it, you know. And uh, and so I, I, you know, I work mainly with with younger people in schools and and through the education department. And I run a, quite a few, you know, art workshops or weaving workshops, and we talk about the importance of of symbolism and and stories and and what that represents for us, but also caring for country. So mm. with the site that. Um, is that on the bluff, you know, that's a very important site for us, but that's the only spot within Victor Harbour that is still somewhat close to its natural, um, to its native state, that it, before, um, you know, non-Indigenous people come here, it, it, it looked like that before they came here long, you know, uh, two, uh, 100 and so years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're fighting to preserve that space. You know, people come from all over the world to visit that site. But if there's a marina there, how could we, our story, be celebrated if it's been disturbed and, 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 and the spirit of the place has been destroyed? And so we're put fighting to preserve it, to, to keep it as it is, so that, you know, for generations to come, they can still come and gather there. Granite Island, you know, with the penguins, um, you know, that's what brings people here. But them penguins were here long ago before people, well, what we say, crinkly people, non-Indigenous people come here. And we've always lived amongst them. And, you know, we're not against development because we develop when we, we, um, were created here and we, we made home here, but we lived amongst it. We didn't destroy anything to, to, to survive. You know, everything we coexist with and, and, 
And that's one thing that people are not aware of, the great respect that we as, as Nungas, as, as Aboriginal people, uh, we got a great respect and a great um, connection and belonging to our lands and waters. And without it, we, we can't thrive. We, we, can't, we can't be us. And, and you know, when I want to say without it, like Naranjiri for general, when, when the drought, millennium drought came, you know, we felt this constant mourning, this constant sadness within our spirit, within our heart. And it because our lands were suffering, our Nazis, our totems were suffering. And, and, you know, the rain wasn't coming. So we knew something was wrong. You know, we knew, you know, we can't do nothing about it because, you know, it, it is it's a part of the cycle of life. And we all got to make sure that we're doing our part to look after it too. Thank you so much, Cedric. Um, so much amazing wisdom and knowledge in there. And thank you so much for sharing those stories. And I think, you know, that conversation of us and together and community and um, centering that in the stories we're telling is so, so important to remember. Um, and what really makes us hopeful, or I think as individuals in this world is coming together on all of this. Um, and uh, I'd love to jump to Claire now um, to talk about that, that story of well, the collective story. Because um, I think a lot of what we hear, especially in mainstream media and the news is, is doom and gloom and scary. And it's important, obviously, not to shy away from the realities and some of these really hard truths. But at the same time, there's so much goodness going on. And through your work, you've met with people all across Australia um, from all walks, different walks of life who are really driving change, both individually and also in their communities. So um, I'd love for you to speak to some of that. Thanks, Beatrice. And it's just a delight to be here and part of this group. And Cedric, all power to your fight. Like I, and solidarity for that because um, it's a it's so important and fundamental to your family and your people's um, culture. So, yeah, all heart for that and and solidarity. Um, Thank what you. I picked up in real what I really picked up and what you were talking about is, you know, story is embedded in the way that we live, and it, it is for all of us. It's you know we rely on stories to to build relationships, make friendships, learn from our past, um, and try and imagine the future. And I think we sometimes shy away from that reality. Like we're humans thrive on story. Our culture is the fabric of, of our society. And um, I just think that what I learned from writing this book, Together We Can, was that, you know, everyone has a story, um, but, you know, we're not always great at sharing that. And so kind of tried to pull together a whole lot of stories in, in one place where people who might be worried about climate change, worried about the state of the world, have a, a way to kind of help balance our brains a little bit, I guess. And um, and there's no doubt it's a really scary time. And I'm going to rattle off some numbers because, you know, I'm a climate advocate person and, you know, we always talk about numbers a bit, um, sometimes to our detriment. But the Climate Council tells us that we have to reduce emissions by 75% by 2030 and get to net zero by 2035. And the current government targets for our country are 43%. And, you know, we're a long, so that's a big gap. And every time we miss the opportunity to reduce those emissions that are harming our, our, our country, harming the world, harming people and changing our weather, um, every time we get away from that target, um, every 1.1% of a degree really, really matters. So um, I came to doing this particular project, which was a little bit kind of returning to my journalism, but also um, kind of a step away from doing the traditional kind of um, communications and storytelling work that we do as advocates, was because I led a project with um, Rebecca Huntley, who's a social researcher who folks might know who are on this call. It's called Climate Compass, and it showed me that while we see lots of doom and gloom stories of extinctions, 
of extreme weather events, of people who are suffering because their energy bills are too high and we've got these extreme kind of, you know, summer temperatures and things like that. Um, sometimes it can feel like it's it's not really shared as a worry or a concern. You kind of feel like you're on your own a little bit sometimes. But the Climate Compass really revealed that there are millions of people in this country who are, who are very concerned about climate change. Um, we, we categorise people a bit, not that you can really ever categorise people, but people kind of form into these clusters and the alarmed and concerned kind of clusters that were exposed through our research um, found that there was about half the country who are actually really quite worried about climate change, like totally freaking out is how I put it. What was more revealing is when we refreshed the research in 2022 after our initial period in 2020, um, people, 58% of people said that they were more concerned about climate change than they were two years previously. Um, and when you look at young people aged 16 to 25, it was 68%. And a lot of that rising concern is being driven by extreme weather events. And so we've got a lot of really worried people out there and people who are looking for something to do. Our research also showed that people don't know where to go or where to turn. Um, they're confused by the options um, and they feel like they need to do the right thing to make the biggest impact. And so people who are in that stage of like not really knowing how to start, kind of feeling a bit confused by the options, um, they'll stop and they'll keep recycling. And recycling is very good and all of your organizations and you're at home, recycling is a really fantastic thing to do, a bit complicated at the moment with supply chains and, and that kind of thing. But it is um, not the number one cause of climate change. It is the burning and mining of fossil fuels and that is what is warming our planet. It's the vast majority. And Australia is one of the biggest um, folks responsible for that. So, um, that's all the big scary picture of worried people, big planetary impacts and the massive targets that we're not likely to meet anytime soon if you just took the glass half empty view of it. But something that's really resonated for me is a book, a fabulous book that I read this year. It's about 10 years old by Claudine Rankin, who's an, a US poet, black woman, feminist. Um, and she said in her book, Citizen, the state of emergency is also always a state of emergence. And for me, that was what was really exposed by just having a bit of a look around the country on what is going on across all sectors in response to this grave threat to our very existence. And I met, you know, a speech pathologist in Kingaroy in Queensland who she just transformed herself. Um, her name's Susan Mungle. And she just went from being a mum of four working a normal job, going to church, playing the flute, to becoming an absolute climate activist who now hosts, she's hosted thousands of conversations um, using the resources and materials that are available from a really awesome group called Climate for Change. Um, I spoke to um, the Sober Beer Company. They're a non-alcoholic brewer and they are Indigenous owned and run um, up again, based in Queensland, who are just building sustainability practices and carbon neutrality into all of their practices. I met Julia Reiser, who's a marine scientist who is inventing a new form, a new biological material that can replace all of our plastic. And I talked to um, an incredible group in Western Sydney called Voices for Power, who are a, a, an alliance, if you like, of community, religious and faith groups who are organising in Western Sydney to ensure that people are delivered climate and energy justice and people are responding to that and engaging with that challenge. And so I'm in a really privileged position because I get to see and absorb all of the wins that are happening throughout the climate movement all the time, but that is a really privileged position. There is work going on, people are taking legal action. There are groups, you know, on the front lines up in central Queensland, First Nations folks, who are resisting um, the exploitation of their land. There are folks in the Torres Strait who have launched a global climate um, case. So there is community groups that are trying to electrify their suburb, which is what's happening down here in um, Wollongong with Electrify Australia's 2515 um, campaign. So there are people moving across all sectors. I spoke to people in big finance right down to small community groups. And I spoke to people who are um, recovering from bushfire devastation and using incredible community connections and relationship building to do that. 
So these stories, I found them very powerful and I couldn't fit all of them into the book. Um, but I, it just got me thinking about if, if storytelling is the, builds the culture that creates the social fabric of this country, we have an incredible opportunity now given you know, there is a government that is actually taking climate action seriously for the first time in a long time. And there is also, you know, um, a, a pressing need to act and people have experienced the impacts of these extreme weather events. So I guess with all of this activity that's happening, you know, what can you do? You could do almost anything and probably make a, a positive difference. But I, I take um, kind of guidance from Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who is a marine scientist as well, but she founded the All We Can Save project. And she has a bit of a framework on how you might want to interact with um, taking action on climate. And um, you'll probably hear how Yale did that when she speaks next. But, you know, looking at what your, what your joy is, what your passion is, and then looking at what you're really good at, your skill set, and looking at what's required now is what she recommends. Because if you combine that, you'll see a beautiful Venn diagram of what you might pick or start Google searching. But I think there's another piece to it, and it's um, drawn from some social research called um, on. It's called complex contagions theory, and you know it's all very dense and very interesting for nerds like me. But it's basically on the premise that if you're tapping your networks and influencing your networks, and more of more people in the same in your networks are doing the same thing, you're more likely to spread behaviour change a lot faster. And I just think about the cultural authority, the influence that you all have in the work that you're doing. It's just an incredible opportunity right now to, to jump in, to, to help tell the stories that people need to be told so they feel inspired and motivated to act. Because I can tell you after, after doing this book and um, you know, writing up all these stories, I felt more motivated than ever. I'd just been through a big kind of climate grief crash myself when I started looking at doing this project. So yeah, I guess um, everyone has a story but you're all the storytellers. And so I, I guess my challenge for you is how, how would you think about making your contribution at this moment when it's more important than possibly any other this generation? And um, yeah, I've got a whole lot of resources and ideas that I'll pop into the chat. And I'm just so heartened to see some of the new organizations that have been springing up, um, you know, like the cultural, uh, Sydney Inst Cultural Institutions for Climate Action, um, I'd encourage people to get involved in Groundswell that aims to um, raise money for climate but or climate advocacy, but also do a whole lot of culture shifting work. There's Climart that's based in Melbourne and also comms declare. So I'll pop them all in the chat. So um, can't wait to hear the rest of the conversation. It's, it's, it's been pretty great so far. Thanks, Cedric. Thank you, Claire. Amazing. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, if anyone hasn't read Together We Can, I highly, highly recommend it. I've read it twice and it is a wonderful reminder of, yeah, that we are all part of this extraordinary movement of people driving change in multiple different ways. And I think it's really important to remember that we do all have power ag and agency, especially as storytellers and people with a platform, whether it be social media, a stage, music, um, theatre, visual art, um, you know, we all have that circle of influence. Um, but also to remember that none of it has to be perfect, you know, and we will all have different capacities to drive change. Uh, it can be very overwhelming and scary. And I think Claire is right in saying totally freaking out is sometimes how we feel. Um, and I think just coming back to those stories of we've actually got this and there's so many incredible we talented people doing what they can in their capacity and time and uh, also remembering that it's so important to centre all voices as part of that conversation moving forwards. Um, so I'd love to jump to Yale now. Uh, Gail, you're an actor by trade, but you have also founded this wonderful organisation called High Neighbor, which has a twofold approach, of not only tackling you know, the tangible emissions reduction, but also bringing community together to skill and train those industries of the future. Um, High Neighbour was somewhat kind of grown out of climate anxiety and fear and all those complex emotions. Um, but I think, you know, it's important for us all to remember that we, we don't have to be a politician. We don't have to be a, a climate scientist. We've, we've all got an amazing role to play. Um, 
And I'd love to hear your story of kind of navigating that space. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cedric and Claire and, and Beatrice. I'm a little overwhelmed by everyone's loveliness. Um, but I think I just, just really want to speak from the heart, I guess, because there's a story I know, my own story very well. Um, but I don't want to do it like a press release, you know. Uh, it's like this stuff is very painful and and it connects to us all through, via the places that we live, I think, most immediately, you know, and the people that we love and the things we stand to lose. And I think for me, the work that I'm trying to do with High Neighbour is very much about our local community and that really every day grounds me because I could spin off and, and go into my own little egocentric world, but every day in my inbox and on my phone are local people that I'm working with, with local concerns that are very real. And that's a, that's a beautiful way to begin. So we're talking about feeling overwhelmed. We're talking about anxiety. For me, my very intense feelings of anxiety led me to make some big decisions. I gave up my green card for the US. I used to, to work in America. Um, I decided to stay here in Australia and try and find a solution. And I slopped all over the place trying to work out what to do. I spoke to, to Claire very early on in the journey for some help. I thought, I'm going to make a documentary. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Then COVID happened. That made a documentary hard. Um, and in the end, I thought, I'm going to build something something that will last, that can repu rep replicate really good actions, that will put tools in other people's hands. So it's not about me, it's about sharing ideas of bringing people together, helping other people out. And I'm gonna try and do that again and again and again, so that over time we can, we can measure big CO2 reduction on a local level, and we can support local people with scholarships to train in low carbon technologies. And at, at first it'll be 10 people, then it'll be 20 people, and eventually it'll be a thousand people. That's my hope. And they're modest hopes, but for me, they mean everything, you know? And as you say, B, I'm an actor. I don't know shit, you know? <clears throat> but I can feel and I can think and I can learn. The empathy, is a really important first step because when we listen, when we listen to Cedric's story about his family and, and what's been lost, we can feel that, you know, and as artists, we can maybe synthesize it and, and maybe share it back in a way that makes that story echo. And that's a really important thing. And then we add it, we gotta add action to that. So it can't just be, I feel this, I'm enjoying my feelings, I'm going to allow that to alleviate my, my anxiety. We've got to add action in there. And that's really important because I think, and I'm going to be the artist that actually says this all, oh, but yeah. sometimes we can, we can self-satisfy with our feelings. And we can process, oh, I've, I've heard that story, I've understood that, I've felt that, I've synthesised that, and we forget to act. And we've got to act. We've got to go out and support people who are doing the good work. You don't have to start an organisation. But there's somebody out there who needs your time, your money, your expertise, maybe one day a week, something an hour a week, something. I guarantee there's somebody in your world that needs your help. So synthesizing those feelings, those understandings, that storytelling instinct, and your incredible ability to, to be in somebody else's shoes, and then taking that and using it for action, positive action. Amazing. Oof, I feel like I've got um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Yale. And yeah, I mean, the emotion, right, and the emotional connection to these really complex and scary, urgent challenges is where 
the arts and cultural sector really comes in. And I think that's, you know, our opportunity to lead to this new amazing future, hopefully. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, that, that in going, coming from a place of action and turning those emotions into something is so important. I feel like for me, hope is a, a doing word it, and, and doing it with other people. You know, you feel part of this, um, this world and this, this movement. Um, and, you know, I think action also looks different for everyone, um, but you can't necessarily act if you haven't seen it yet, right? Or if you haven't, if you don't believe it's possible. And that's where storytelling comes in. Um, and I'd love to jump to Andy now uh, to hear about some of your work. I mean, so much of your work at Slingsby and the work that you do as a director and theatre maker is uh, a lot of these productions are kind of centering these messages of the urgency of climate crisis and ecological collapse and challenges. Um, but also you're doing a lot of amazing work in the background with Slingsby's screen touring model and bringing your audiences and stakeholders and staff along that journey of change, um, which is so exciting. And I think it's really important to remember that we, we have that agency and that storytelling and linking these really hard messages into that action or that education. Um, you know, you bring things into schools and talk to younger audiences. Um, yeah, can you speak to that for us? Yeah, thank you, B, and thank you, Yale and, and Claire and Cedric. Um, yeah, so so um, so Slingsby, we, we've always told stories um, of hope uh, because I, yeah, as an artist, I'm 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 not interested in kind of um, letting people leave a piece of theatre feeling worse off. Um, and and storytelling is is so powerful. And and so we you know we have a recurring theme in all of our work really where where we're following a character who finds themselves lost or confused. And, and doesn't know what to do, but through their experience of the world and the people that they meet, they find their way back to hope uh, and, and reconnected to the wonder of, of the world and the universe that we that we live in. And, and sort of, you know, we, we tell stories for, for young people, for people aged eight, but to remind adults of that as well, to really, because I think the more you hear a story with a happy ending, with, with positivity, with a, with a positive, not, not a saccharine, but a truthful, hopeful ending, the more you believe that is possible in your own life. Uh, and so, and that's, an, that's an important thing that storytelling can do for us. Um, and, you know, during the pandemic, um, we had this incredible opportunity to create an ensemble of artists. So we, we created Slingsby's Flying Squad, um, which was an ensemble of artists, five artists employed on two year contracts. Which is quite a rare thing in theatre. Um, so we had we wound up having a team of six artists, uh, and they were employed on two-year contracts to create their own work and tour it, um, principally across South Australia. Uh, and that ensemble included two First Nations artists, Alexis West and Joshua Campton, uh, and also a Nivanuatu man, Edward Junior. And uh, and so and so with that work, we started to create an opportunity for them to tell their own stories, rather than you know, someone else writing a story and them just acting and telling the story. We built works on their own experiences. And the first production was um, called This Tree is a Story About Everything, including you, as told by me, um, which was five personal stories of connections to trees, um, which connects us to, to family tree, which connects us to heritage. Um, and it was, it was very powerful to watch those stories told in regional schools uh, and for, for young people to, to see their own stories in a way being told by those artists. Uh, and in, in uh, Adelaide Festival this year, we premiered The River That Ran Uphill, which uh, is a production uh, as told by Edgel Jr. So Edgel Jr. Um, is a Nivan man and he was in Vanuatu in Port Vila when Cyclone Pam hit in 2015. So, so this is his personal experience of really the, the, the Pacific being on the front edge of, um, of this catastrophe. Um, and so, you know, we're very conscious not to add to people's grief, but at the same time, what a rare opportunity to hear uh, first person. Uh, and, so, and so this production 
uh, told by Edgelin and supported by the rest of the flying squad, you know, amazingly wound up for, for people being a very hopeful piece of theatre. I mean, it told very, very honestly what the situation is. Um, and, and awfully during, during that Adelaide Festival season, um, Port Villa was hit by two more uh, um, cyclones. And images that we were sort of representing on stage were happening again. Um, uh, and so, you know, but from that piece, Edgel kind of, the, the piece ends with Edgel saying, sharing what his father used to say to him, which was, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, we go together. And, and that really, I, I think, gives us a sense that we, that we can all, as, you know, Claire, your book sounds like, it, you know, I have to get your book and read it. It does sound like, as a movement, we can, we can all get a lot further down the road. And, uh, and as you mentioned, last year, we, um, we put into action a green touring model where we are now um, measuring our carbon footprint with all of our touring. Um, so that then we can start to, I guess, influence the, the venues that are presenting us as well by asking them a whole lot of questions. Um, and, and they've been, you know, those venues have been amazing in going, we don't know the answer to that, but thank you. We'll, we'll start to, to look into that. Um, and then really as part of that, once we knew what our carbon footprint was, we've started to try to do offset work in person, which now I understand you know, we should be calling onset work. And that work really uh, goes back to a, from, from B really, from you helping us to establish that, that green touring model and then connecting us to, to Lot 50 Kanyanya Pillar, which kind of connects me back to a, a, a long-term friendship and relationship over 18 years with Carl Winter Telfer, who's a Ghanamina man, uh, Malawirimina um, Burka, Senior, senior man. And so we've been working with Carl to do land care work and, and reforest to regenerate um, Kanyanya Pillar, which is country that the Catholic Church have handed back to Carl and family. So, so that is just super practical, simple, very fulfilling work that we know that when we're traveling uh, on other countries sharing story, that the carbon uh, impact of that will be addressed uh, to help Carl and his family be able to return to country and share his story on country. Um, and, so, and so the next step for us as a company is uh, we're creating a new major work. We generally make one new work every 18 months, but over the next three years, we'll be ma making a triptych of works under the title of a concise compendium of wonder. And these will be three full productions performed by one cast on one set. So when we tour internationally in the future, um, we'll be uh, having one lot of freight and one lot of airfares for three productions so that we can stay in a community for three times as long, build a deeper relationship with the audience and with the community there. And the set for that work will be uh, a regeneratively designed building that can sit in the public space so that people can um, come and hear about the project and about the work and hopefully be inspired um, to, do, to, to get involved and, and, and start their own journey. Uh, and those three productions tell the story of humanity's shifting relationship with nature over the last, well, it's an 1800 year story, that one, those three stories. So, um, so yeah, we, we we're really just getting started, <laughs> and and it is it has been through, you know, connecting with people like you, B, and now I feel connected to 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 other people to keep doing that work, and it is it's actually quite achievable, you know. We're a, we're a quite very small company, but um, yeah, it's it's um it's very motivating because young people who are at the centre of our audience do have a sense of impending doom about the future. And as a theatre maker, I've always been inspired and, and, you know, inspired by the challenge to kind of help them see the beauty and wonder and possibility of the universe. And, um, and it's an urgent, 
urgent story. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, yeah, everyone will have to um, keep an eye out for all of Slingsy's productions. They're incredible. I've seen some of them and they're so moving, um, but I think, yeah, inspired by the challenge. If there's one key takeaway for me, um, you know, this stuff is hard and it's complex and it's scary, um, but there's just so much incredible stuff going on. Um, and working in that space, that's my experience. And yes, there's struggles, um, but, you know, it's about connecting all these amazing dots and cross-pollination of ideas. And, you know, the other key takeout, I guess, um, for me from today's session is just reach out, collaborate, um, share the struggles because they are shared struggles, but also share the inspiration and the ideas and the knowledge. Um, we will be sending around all of this wonderful wisdom with lots of resources and tools and guides um, after the webinar. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but before we jump to some quick question time, I would love to circulate back to all of our wonderful speakers just for a quick minute or two to kind of, I guess, provide kind of a key action or way of thinking or an inspiration or ritual or anything that can kind of um, leave everyone who's listening today inspired or um, excited to kind of drive these kind of changes in their organization or their practice or within their community. Um, so I'll jump back to Cedric first. Deadly. Yeah, I would love to leave, uh, you know, just a thought of, you know, like within our culture, we all got a part to play. We all have a part in, we all have a responsibility in caring for country and caring for stories, keeping them strong. And, you know, I want, you know, the, the wider community to, to connect with their miwi, as we call it in our language. Your miwi means your, your spirit, the very essence that makes you the person that you are. And where does that your miwi feel strong at? And how can your miwi help care for, look after, and do your part in, in, in keeping country strong and deadly? Amazing. I love that so much. <laughs> um, Claire, I'll jump to you. Yeah, I thought I'd just read just a brief snippet from my book, which is actually a quote of um, Joanna Macy and Chris Johnson's um, Active Hope. And with Active Hope, we realise that there are adventures in store, strengths to discover and comrades to link arms with. Active Hope is a readiness to discover the strengths in ourselves and in others, a readiness to discover the reasons for hope and the occasions for love a readiness to discover the size and strength of our hearts, our quickness of mind, our steadiness of purpose, our own authority, our love of life, the liveliness of our curiosity, the unsuspected deep well of patience and diligence, the keenness of our senses and our capacity to lead. And none of these can be discovered in an armchair or without risk. Deadly. Amazing. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to you. I feel like I have a funny role in this conversation. Um, I'm going to be so practical. I'm going to be so practical and not beautiful and poetic like these two amazing people before me. Um, I think we, I think we need to talk to our unions a bit more strongly about what we want as artists. I think we need to feed back to our unions. Hey, we want our super to be going into a fund that is not funding things that are terrible for the planet. There's great options out there where we can have, you know, put our money into our retirement fund and it, it not destroy the earth. So I think that's one really practical thing that you could do today, write to your union and say, hey, I'm concerned about my super. What are we doing? Are we pressuring our super to either change or are we gonna threaten to, to shift, shift up and move? That's one really practical thing. Also, um, super inspired by, by green touring models, um, sustainable screens, which I think is launching next week. How can we make theatre, film, television and uphold the values of the stories we're telling? What's going on behind the curtain? How much is it costing our planet to tell these stories? Um, there is one last thing in my head and I don't want to forget it. Bloody hell. 
it is that we need to look at who's funding our shows, right? Again, behind the curtain, who is funding this show? Are we okay with those people having their logo in the, in the pamphlet, in the foyer? Are they the right people to be giving money to, to get this story told? Because it doesn't make sense if we're telling a story about connecting and caring for country when we've got a group that completely disrespects that idea funding it. We've got to think about where money comes from. Those are my three thoughts. Thank you. Brilliant, yeah. Um, and um, I will quickly mention that it's such an important thing to be talking about, especially in the arts, is where our money is coming from and where it is going to. Um, and we're having a session focusing on that exact topic uh, for the third webinar, which is the 21st um, of June. So jump into that one. Um, thanks, Al. I'll hand over to Andy. Uh, yeah, and I would say, you know, through your encouragement, we did, uh, we moved our company's money out of the Commonwealth Bank to a uh, to another bank that that doesn't invest in fossil fuels so um it's it, it's sort of fun process but it feels so great <laughs> once you've done it and um yeah i would just say my two things are it's a whole team effort and that's that's motivating in itself like we're a small company of like you know three full-time staff um but we're all sharing, we all have roles within this transformation. And I just say the touring artists that tour with us uh, feel like a, a sense of pride and, uh, and, a, and a sense of, you know, they're taking action as well. So when they arrive at the theatre, if the theatre hasn't turned off the heaters in the dressing rooms before we arrive, as we've requested, they'll turn them off. And, you know, like it's, we're, we're, all, we're all doing this together. Um, and that, that keeps you motivated every day. Um, and for me as well, getting out on country and spending time and listening to First Nation knowledge, um, it's kind of all has to begin and end on country is where, is where we're trying to head as a company. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few um, questions, which I'll very quickly touch on just one. I think the question has been answered in itself in the chat, um, which is how important is the notion of collective action in the arts and how can we better help support each other? And um, Kelly has also shared a wonderful quote in the chat, which I think answers this, uh, which is from Bill McKibben. Uh, and it is, what can I do? How can I, what can I do as an individual? And the answer to that is stop being an individual, um, which I think is quite powerful. And yeah, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and your wisdom and sharing that today. Uh, I hope everyone um, has, you know, taken something from this chat and feels inspired and excited. Uh, we will be sharing all of this information uh, with so many wonderful links and ways that you can take action both within your practice and broader community. Uh, so stay tuned on the Australia Council website for that. Uh, there's two more webinars as part of this series. So next week we are talking about energy and the energy revolution and rewiring the arts. And then the following week, we are talking about money and sponsorship. Um, so if you've got time, please jump into those sessions. Um, Thanks for everyone joining and for taking this hour out of your day. Uh, I hope you feel inspired and excited. And I think I'd like to leave us with a quote from the storyteller and uh, director and filmmaker, Damon Gamo, who I'm sure many of you know, um, which is that stories help to shape our culture. Um, our culture shapes our leaders. Our leaders shape our policy. And then our policy shapes our system. And I to add to that, our system then shapes our world. And um, yeah, so we've got a really exciting opportunity to drive change and come together on that. Um, thanks so much, everyone. And I hope to see you at the next two webinars. Thank you. Anonymity means thank you. And Naranjari, Nom, that means thank you all. Ruti Nyanana, all you good speakers. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. We don't say we don't say goodbye in a court. We say nothing. That means we shall see you next time. Yeah. See you next time, Cedric. Nothing. Next time.